Today's scripture reading will be Philippians 3, 12 to 14. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend, for that which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which before, which are before. Thank you. Thank all of you. Thank you for letting me come and be here with you. It is a pleasure to be here with you experiencing the blessings of the Holy Spirit, isn't it? Our children in the church school, it's so great. You'll have to bear with me a little bit this morning. I, I usually think I'm a pretty up speaker, and maybe I'll get that way before things get through today. But I had uh, called a couple of people this week and said, hey, I'd love to see you in church. And one of them said, sure, I'd love to be there with you, Robert. And then I got a text this morning that said, no, I don't think I'll ever be there on any Sabbath. Be a downer, wouldn't it? And what if it was your fault? Oh, that'd be a real downer, wouldn't it? But that's not what I'm talking about. My lesson is about overcoming and having a strategy for being a successful Christian. That's what it's all about, I believe. You can't be successful at too much unless you practice a lot and have a strategy. You see, these children are successful this morning because they've practiced. And Jim had a strategy. I have a story to start with this morning to tell you, and you may have heard it before, and if you have, I may embellish it differently or something, and hopefully it's a new story for you then. This is a story about a, a young boy, and Mitchell, the boy's name is Bobby, okay? Because when we go to bed at night, we have Bobby stories whether it's from the Bible or personal experience, they're all Bobby stories. This is about Bobby Mitchell, if you'll like to listen to it. Bobby went out into the field near his house, and he took with him a baseball bat and a ball. And Bobby threw that ball up in the air, he took the bat off of his shoulder and swung it as hard as he could and missed. Strike one, Bobby said. Well, he picked up the ball and he threw it up in the air, swung the bat as hard as he could and missed. Bobby picked up the bat and looked it over. There might have been a hole in it. He picked up the ball again, and he threw it up in the air as hard as he could. And as it came down, he swung that bat as hard as he could. Strike three. Bobby said, wow, what a pitcher. I'm not sure this morning where you want to put yourself. Are you a pitcher or a batter? But I am sure that as sure as I have, every one of you has struck out sometime or another. Right? Are you full of enthusiasm? Are you eagerly looking forward to each day and what it will bring? Or are you filled with a sense of dread, worried that this year, this day, this month, this week will be the worst you've ever had? Now, someone said to me 
from the congregation here some weeks ago. Robert, you always got such a long face. I didn't realize that, but I thought, you know, they just don't know the burdens I carry. And at that time, I was down. I was striking out. I realized I wanted to do better. I wanted to take advantage of my walk with the Lord, but it wasn't working. It's like one of my children told her sister, she says, does this work for you? It doesn't work for me. When I heard that, I felt never have I heard such terrible words. That believing in Jesus doesn't work for you. I cannot imagine that. Because I have always been able to jump back in and keep life going. I'd like to suggest that like the little boy with the ball and the bat, your attitude, your frame of mind, your reaction to the events around you, largely determined whether the day is a day of victory or a day of defeat. The Apostle Paul was not one to let circumstances conquer him. With the help of God, he was determined to win the victor's crown. Listen again to his attitude and the strategy in our text today. If you could turn to Philippians 3, verses 12 through 14. Philippians 3, verses 12 through 14. And I want you to keep the Bible open there so you can check, am I telling you the truth about what I read in those verses? Many times we can be misled. So you've got to check me out and make sure that I'm telling the truth. Now I'm going to read out of the Living Bible. I like the way it reads. I don't mean to say I'm perfect. I have a problem with that. I am perfect because Jesus has forgiven me. Otherwise, I don't have it. And Paul said, I'm not perfect. I haven't learned all I should even yet. But I keep working toward the day when I will finally be all that Christ saved for me and wants me to be. No, brothers. I'm still not all I should be, but I'm bringing all of my energies to bear on this one thing, forgetting the past, looking forward to what lies ahead. I strain to reach the end of the race and receive the prize for which God is calling us up to heaven because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. with Paul's words fresh in our minds, I see Paul making suggestions to help us to be all that we can be. I have identified three factors that are essential strategies to be all God has called us to be. And I believe these are in the text that I've just read from Paul. First of all, you need to recognize the value of time. How do we value a year? Ask a student who failed a grade. Has to do it over a lost year. How do you value a month? Ask an expectant mother. How do you value an hour? Ask someone who lies terminally ill, waiting for someone to come and see them. Well, how do you value a minute? I went to O'Hare Airport one time, several years ago, 
and I was like two minutes late to catch my plane. They pulled the plane away from the gate and they wouldn't come back and get me. Only two minutes. How do you value a second? Ask an Olympic medalist how much difference a second makes. Or ask someone saying goodbye to a loved one they'll never see again. I'm convinced that God doesn't wear a wristwatch. And he doesn't use a calendar. I'm curious, how many people still wear wristwatches? Really? I thought they were gone. I've got a couple of gold ones I was given for years of service when I was a teacher. And they're in a drawer. I don't wear them. Maybe that's because I'm retired and I don't need to know the time. I don't know. Time is important to us because we live in a limited time frame. What makes something valuable? Oftentimes it's scarcity. If there is a scarcity, then the product quickly escalates in value. If something is rare, it's usually valuable. But if we have a lot of it, it loses its value. And the same is true with time. The young feel they've got plenty of time. And therefore, it loses its value. On the other hand, as we get up in years a little bit, we begin to realize our time is limited, therefore becoming much more valuable. I read statisticians saying that the average lifespan is now about 76 years. And if you're under 30, that's a long time. Actually, pretty meaningless. I can remember then. I can also remember that I'm getting very close to 76 years. And it makes a big difference. I pray for the next year. Most everyone knows of Mickey Mantle. Fantastic baseball player, right? He had a real problem with alcohol addiction. His problem was so bad that it ruined his liver. He thought the way to live is to party hard and play hard. But then he had a liver transplant, thinking he might get a few more years. The great Mickey Mantle was always afraid that he would die of cancer. The reason he thought that is that Several people in his family had died of cancer. The great Mickey Mantle called his friend, second baseman, Bobby Richardson to pray with him. He found out that he had cancer. Two weeks later, Bobby Richardson got a call from Mantle's family. They said, Bobby, if you want to see him, you want to say your goodbyes, come now. So he did. And he sat by the bedside of the quickly passing away Mickey Mantle. He said, Mickey, I want to see you in heaven. Mickey Mantle said, I know you don't know but I've given my life over to trusting Jesus. At Mantle's funeral, Bobby Richardson told 2,000 mourners that there are two groups of people, those who say yes to Jesus and those who say no. I'm going to tell you that tomorrow and maybe are no answers. Not that they're not answers. The answer is no if you say tomorrow. The answer is no if you say maybe. 
Time is like a valuable commodity and very precious and delicate vessel. It might break at any moment. We might lose it. All we have is this moment. We don't know anything about tomorrow. We have this moment that Jesus is calling us, and that's all we have. Given the uncertainty of life, I think that is the reason Paul, in 2 Corinthians 6, says, Now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. You know what? In that verse, there was one word that I really wanted you to notice and know. I tried to emphasize it. Listen, I'll read it again. Now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. Not tomorrow. Now. In Hebrews 3.15 it says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, because life is uncertain and we must take advantage of the time that we have. How about the person who texted me and said, I won't be there this Sabbath or any other. Now could be this afternoon for that person, couldn't it? Now could be for me this afternoon and you too. If you want to really be a successful Christian, you must have the strategy of not putting things off, but recognizing that Jesus is calling you right now. Second, if you want to be a really successful Christian, don't be in bondage to the past. Don't be a slave to the past. Don't be tied to what you've already done. We are special. How are we special? God has given us the ability to have memories. And what you remember, your memories, can be your enemy or they can be your friend. When you remember, hopefully you'll remember the good things in life. Chances are that you'll slip and remember the bad things too. I've got, I guess they have their value, but I would love to focus on just the good stuff. Wouldn't you? Yeah. Sometimes when we dwell on the negatives, what happens is we start feeling sorry for my, ourselves. I've done it. That was what was going on with me a month or two ago. I was feeling sorry for myself. Somebody told me they didn't like me. Maybe in this past year, you had a time of transition in your life. And I'm going to list a couple of transitions that I thought of, but maybe you can think of some others. The kids grew up and left home. Maybe your job came to an end. Maybe a loved one died. Maybe it was a time when a particular sin got a hold of you and it hasn't let go yet. And now you feel the burden of guilt of that sin. Those things can cripple and hold us in bondage to the past. That's why in our text today, Paul said, forgetting what is behind. It seemed to be very important to Paul. It's important to me this morning. I'll say it again. Forget what is behind. Paul had a lot to forget. Paul had a very shaky past. He persecuted the growing Christian church, the fledgling Christian church. He even went to the point of killing people who were Christians. So they couldn't be Christians anymore, you know? I don't think it ever stopped anyone. 
he said to his people he was writing to, his, the friend Timothy, he said, I am the chief of sinners. I won't say I'm as bad as him. But I'm probably as bad as David. I never have understood how the, the Bible could promise that Samson would be in heaven. But it does, doesn't it? And if David can be there and Samson can be there and the murderer called Moses can be there, I've got a good chance. <laughs> Paul said, forgetting what is behind. In other words, he said, God, I commit it to you. I'm seeking your forgiveness for all the sins of the past and I look forward to what lies ahead. And right now, I'm going to live today the best that I can. I believe that's pretty good advice. Live today the best you can and forget the past. I want to be successful, so I'm going to include that in my strategy. I certainly need to know the value of now, of time. And I can't be in bondage to the past whether it's yours or mine. Next, I think we need to establish priorities. You know, we need to know what to put into our lives. What's important? In this text that I've had read today, Paul says, this one thing I do. How many things was he worried about? One. Obviously, Paul did many other things. The Bible says he made tents. He preached sermons. He set up churches. He healed the sick. And we know him best that he wrote books. More than half of the New Testament is written by Paul. But he said, the top priority in my life is to press on toward the goal, to win the prize for which God has called me. What was his top priority? To press on towards the goal, to forget the past, to know where I need to go. I read a little illustration. It's about giving speeches is where it was. An expert on the subject of time management was giving a talk to a group of business students at a conference. After a while of speaking to them, he said, okay, it's time for a quiz. I always hated that when I went to a conference when they wanted you to write something down. I was here to listen, not, not go to school. Think about the quiz. He reached under the table he was standing behind and he got a one gallon glass jar with a big old top to it. You know, the kind that they used to sell candy out of and the big glass lid on it? He put that up on the table. And then he got out a box of rocks about the size of my hand. And he started putting them into the glass jar until he got in all the rocks he could fit. Then he turned to the class and said, is it full? And one student, George, said yes. And he said no. First question on the quiz, you just got it wrong. It's not full. And he reached under the table and he brought out a bucket of pea gravel. You know, the little tiny stuff? And he poured that in and shook the jar and it settled down in around the big rocks. He turned to the class and said, is it full? And the class was starting to catch on. And one student said, I don't think so. 
little hesitant there, you see. And then he said, good, you're starting to catch on. And he reached under the table and he got a bucket of sand. And he started pouring that down in and shaking the jar. And as it went down in, it went between the big rocks and it went in between the pea gravel until it came all the way even with the top of the jar. And he said, is it full? And of course, almost the whole class now said, no. He said, you're doing really well. He got under the table again and brought out a pitcher of water and poured that into the jar. And when it was running over, he asked the class, is it full? And of course, they said, yes. And then he turned to the class and he said, what I'm saying to you today, what is the point of that illustration? And one eager beaver, beaver class member raised their hand and said, you can always get a little more into your schedule if you really try hard. He said, eh, wrong. That's not the point of the illustration. And everyone who thinks it is has failed today's quiz. The point of the illustration is this. If you don't put the big rocks into your life first, you'll never get them in. What are the big rocks that you need to put into your life? I thought about that and made a little list, just a little one. Family, right? Definitely one you want in the jar. Friends. As your friend, I want to be one of those rocks in your jar. A big one. Your job. You know, you prepare a long time to have a career, don't you? Spend a lot of money on it sometimes. So that needs to be one of the big rocks you put in. And then I thought some more about really what am I talking about here. I'm talking about spending time with God in prayer. Don't do enough of it. It's probably pea gravel in my life instead of a big rock. But I'm suggesting it ought to be a big rock. Seeking his guidance for your life through reading his word. Another big rock. I think those last two are probably ought to have been the first two rocks that I put into the jar. Not saying that I shouldn't have family, job, friends, but those two probably should be the first two. Remember, if you don't put those big rocks in first, you'll just never get them in. It was Jesus who said, seek first his kingdom. One of the big rocks, right? And everything else will be given to you as well. You know, I'm trusting God to keep his word. I'm doing my best to make sure I've got those big rocks in first. Trusting God is a very important part of our lives. In order to have a strategy of success, to know that now is the day, forgetting the past, and setting priorities, those are the strategies, and I trust God that they'll work. An old woman, could have been a man, ran out of money. She didn't have enough to pay her rent or her grocery bill or her utility bills. And she only had a candle to keep her warm in her small abode. So she prayed and asked Jesus to take care of her, to send her some help. And huddled around that candle on a cold winter day, she was warming her hands, and there was a knock at the door, and she became afraid. 
She was afraid it was the landlord coming to ask for the rent. So she blew out the candle and quietly sat there in the dark. Two weeks later, she found out that a friend had come and was bringing enough money to pay the rent and all her bills. I wonder how many times I've heard and ignored the gentle knock of the Savior. I've asked him to come and help me, and when he does, I'm afraid. The Savior wants to come in to our life. He wants to be one of the big rocks in the jar and free us from the burdens of sin. But many, including myself, have often ignored his knocking. Like Paul, we need to be able to say if we want a working strategy. I don't mean to say I'm perfect. I haven't learned all that I should, even yet. But I keep working toward that day when I will finally be all that Christ saved me for and wants me to be. No, dear brothers, I'm still not all I should be, but I'm bringing all of my energies to bear on this one thing, forgetting the past, looking forward to what lies ahead. I strain to reach the end of the race and receive the prize for which God is calling us up to heaven because of what Christ Jesus did for us. As you strive to be all that Jesus called you to be, do not become discouraged. One of the biggest enemies of Christians is called discouragement. Not really trusting Jesus. We have to trust that Jesus gives us the strength to move forward every day. During a Monday night football game between the New York Giants and the Chicago Bears, one of the announcers mentioned that the great Walter Payton had accumulated over nine miles in moving the ball down the field. The other announcer commented, yeah, and that's with somebody knocking him down every four yards. That's doggedly pursuing the goal, isn't it? That's Paul's strategy for us. One small victory at a time. And I leave you with that today.